Hello everyone. I welcome you all on behalf of the Women Translating Women Project, uh, established by the Ashoka Center for Translation and uh, supported by the Sushambedi Memorial Fund. Um, we, have, we have come together for the first Sushambedi Memorial Lecture today to celebrate the life and work of the Hindi author and poet Sushambedi in whose memory this fund supporting the many voices of women authors and translators has been set up. Today, on her third death anniversary, we honor her commitment and spirit to language, literatures, and the lives spent and liberated in between. And those of you who attended the inaugural lecture last year would also know that I had used the same quote by Sushamji uh, while making this presentation, while introducing her, because I particularly, as a student of language, or to borrow from Kabir, as a merchant of language, am actively thinking about uh, this quote uh, in which Shushamji situates language uh, between the questions of bordering and belonging. So today, the memorial lecture will be delivered by Professor Gabriela Nikolieva, whom we are delighted to host at the center, albeit online, and whom I shall introduce shortly. We inaugurated the Women Translating Women Project in August last year. And today I am excited to announce a couple of things. Uh, the most important of them being our publishing partnership with Zuban Publishers or Zuban Books, uh, whose director, Urvashi Butalia, had given the inaugural lecture for the Women Translating Women Project last year. I'm also delighted to announce five of the books being included in the list for the first year. And I await the long list of authors and translators that will join this list as, as it grows and expands uh, over the next few years. So the five books that we have uh, uh, in our list, list of books for the first year being published by Zuban Books include uh, Gupta Dhan by Sangeeta Bondhapadhyay, translated from the ba Bangla by Ipsha Shamaddar. Uh, we have short stories by Razia, Sad Razia Sajjad Zahir, translated from the Urdu by Sabah Bashir. We have Ittihad by Guli Sadarangani, translated by Professor Rita Gothari from the Sindhi. We also have Sh Shushamji's Navabhum Ki Raskatha, translated from the Hindi by Astri Ghosh. And we have uh, from Tamil, uh, Karai Terum Odangal by Ramachandra Nusha being translated by Krupaji. So with these announcements, I am delighted to open uh, today's uh, first Sushambedi Memorial Lecture. And before we go ahead to the lecture and I introduce Professor Ilieva, I did wish to invite uh, Purvaji, Sushamji's daughter and an actress, uh, to say a few words uh, on the occasion and about the life and work of, of Shushanji. Uh, Purvaji, over to you. Hi, I am Purva Bedi, daughter of Sushan Bedi. My father, Rahul Bedi, um, you can all hear me, right? Yes, okay, just checking. <laughs> my father, Rahul Bedi, um, my brother, Varun Bedi, and I, together with our families, are really pleased to have created the Sushumbedi Memorial Fund in her honor to celebrate and share the voices of South Asian women in translation with Ashoka University. Our family was always inspired by her, not only as a writer, but also as a professor who understood the importance of sharing the canon of Hindi literature and literature coming out of India. She was a feminist who believed and advocated for women through her writing. She also believed that, and I always remember hearing her talk about it, this, that India has produced a huge amount of amazing literature in non-English languages. And that work hasn't gotten its due recognition due to the fact that it wasn't translated or published in the Western world. So we are very pleased that we've been able to support Ashoka University Center for Translation as it seeks to address this historically underrepresented group um, and, and work and look forward to working with them to bring these talented women to a much broader audience at, 
um, broadly in India, in the West, and globally. Professor Gabriela Nikolaeva was a cherished friend and a colleague to my mother. And I am so happy that she is speaking today at the first memorial lecture about my mother. She knew her on so many levels, and I hope that you will join me in welcoming her. Thank you for your support and attendance. Thank you, Gabriela. Um, thank you so much, Purvaji. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for introducing uh, Professor Gabriela in a uh, more personal manner than I could have, but uh, I could uh, go ahead with a more formal introduction. Uh, Professor Gabriela, uh, Gabriela Nikolieva is clinical professor and director of the South Asian Language Programs, Department of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies, New York University. Uh, she teaches advanced Hindi language courses, as well as ancient Indian literature and modern South Asian literature courses. Uh, Professor Ilieva works and has published in the field of heritage language education and teacher training, as well as gender analysis in Sanskrit literature. She has translated to Bulgarian short stories by Manto, Kamleshwar, Amrita Pritam, Yashpal, and poetry by Manglesh Dabral and Shusham Bedi. She has also completed the Hindi translation of a Bulgarian poetry collection by female poets, currently in print by Vani Publications. She is the recipient of the Hindi Sevi Saman Award from the Indian President, uh, the Fulbright Nehru Specialist Scholarship, the Golden Dozen Teaching Award from New York University, and the Program Excellent Aw Excellence Award by University Continuing Education Association mid-Atlantic region. And I did share with Professor Elieva that in fact, I came to translation through my brief conversation with Manglesh Dabral. So I was happy to share that little uh, poetry connection with her. I, I welcome Professor Gabriela Nick Elieva on behalf of the Ashoka Center for Translation uh, to deliver the first Susham Bedi Memorial Lecture. Professor Elieva, over to you. Thank you so much. Um... It's more than an honor, it's more than a pleasure. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know what I feel. Uh, I couldn't speak about Sushum for about two years. Uh, and uh, I hope I will be today. Uh, but um, I have this background, the Hava Mehel, one of my favorite places. Um, and that's how I feel <laughs> about being able to focus my uh, mind on Sushum. Um, it's going all kinds of directions. I will try to um, sort of focus on something uh, that I think we need to um, sort of think about you know, in terms of how we um, even um, conceptualize the future of the studies of the Pravasi uh, writers. Um, in a way, um, the, when, we, when we talk about, the, let's say, partition literature, um, we often think about to what extent is it real life? To what extent is it fiction? And does it matter? Do these questions matter? Um, same way, um, the, the Pravasi experience in fiction literature has this um, very uh, sort of rich, um, uh, reality to it. Is it fictional or is it um, out of the real world? We don't know. And do we care? Maybe we shouldn't. But is Pravasi literature a separate genre, especially the Deshi Pravasi literature, because of the sheer numbers, because of the sheer diversity? Now, that is a question I would like to for us to think about. Um, so this is one um, that, you know, um, is sort of giving me a direction of the talk. Two is, um, very often when, when I read uh, about what was said about uh, Susham's uh, writing, it reflects the struggles, it reflects the challenges, it reflects the more negative side of the experience. 
And actually, Susham was a person who was very positive. And even in the way she speaks about the choices for characters, the choices for plots, the choices for uh, destinies, or uh, let's say um, stream of uh, thoughts that she would include in her literature, she would think about and she would say it um, as a positive experience, as a constructive positive experience. Um, she would uh, she would say that she was interested, especially about women, she was interested in the bravery, in the resourcefulness, in their unique paths, um, rather than um, in a way think about what they went through, what they created for themselves um, in those more negative terms where we're talking about mushkiling, where we're talking about sangharsh. Um, another, so this is point two. Point three, I will start with something that might make us emotional, but then uh, we'll uh, get over it, I hope, to continue this uh, conversation. Um, in, in her Afsan short story, she um, shares a moment, a very special moment, where Shankar, who is present in the church to say goodbye to his best friend, who was, who was assimilated, who was completely um, um, atheist, but they shared common, um, common love for um, the wisdoms uh, in old scriptures, you know, old Indian scriptures and uh, the Bhagavad Gita in particular. So um, when Sushum was talking about it in a video that I'm afraid to put on right now because of the emotions that will come to us, uh, but let me try and see if you will be able to hear, she mentioned something very important that I would like us to start with it and I will also provide the uh, concrete um, uh, quote from the story. So let me first um, share my screen. Um, so at this point I will try to, um, let's see, I will try to play what I want to play. Um, and um, and let's see if I will be um, successful. I will remove my earplugs, and I hope that you will be able to hear. So that's our beginning. Jisme Gita ke jo shab hai, jo jivan ki adarta amarta ki baat kehte hain, aur mujhe kahin laga ki jivan. Uh, this is it. Uh, life doesn't end. It ends, but it's, it doesn't end. And I think that this is something that um, in a way speaks um, really strongly about um, one on the one hand, the initiative that uh, started with her family, but on the other hand, uh, her, own, um, her own voice. Um, that definitely cannot die because it is still extremely relevant even uh, 50 years later. Uh, and I'm thinking about a uh, good dose experience in, in Havan. So um, what happens in, in Afsan, uh, and I'm taking only um, the, 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 uh, those uh, episodes that are related to uh, the Gita, when uh, uh, Shankar hears ashes to ashes, dust to dust, from dust thou, from dust thou came and unto dust shall return. Suddenly Shankar felt a snake slither down his spine. It was as if someone were bur burying him under tons of earth. He felt asphyxiated. The soul is never destroyed, nor does it destroy. 
he cannot help himself but say it to everyone in Sanskrit though, he, he didn't, he knew that the, 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 uh, the audience would not understand, but he needed to say that. The soul is never destroyed, nor does it destroy. It is neither born, nor does it ever die. It is beyond life and death. It does not perish as the body, the body dies, as a person sheds old garments and dons new ones. The soul casts off its worn out body and wears a new one. And then later on, he felt as if Diwakar had turned his head from the casket and was smiling at him. Shankar's hair stood on end. For a second, he felt as if Diwakar had not gone anywhere, that he was right there next to him. But was it simply a smile of sincerity or a smirk of derision? I feel that Sushum is uh, looking at us and she has this smile in her face and let's see whether it will be of acceptance and of, uh, uh, and of agreement or maybe not. So uh, when, when, I'm, when I think about Sushim, um, the first time uh, I um, tried to teach her uh, was with her. So when I think about her, it's about what she told me about herself. It's about what she was telling my students about herself. It's about what we discussed about her. So in a way, the way uh, Purva put it, I really have this um, inner access to Sushan that uh, I feel blessed for having and that I know not many people have. For, I would say, close to I don't want to say whether it's two decades, but maybe um, I met her uh, in 1995, but I started working closely to her, with her in 1998. Why? Because she insisted that she would teach a literature class in translation at NYU as an adjunct, and then I would pick it up. And she trained me. And then, of course, she wasn't teaching herself, but then once I started teaching the literature class, then I started teaching her. But then every time I was teaching uh, her, her works, mostly um, the students had, um, had a, uh, have a choice uh, until today to choose uh, several short stories or to choose Havan, to choose the whole uh, novel. And she would come for the day or the two days that we will devote on her. So um, a lot of the things that I will tell you today are a part of what we were discussing with her. I'm not sure whether uh, Tahira Nakvi is here. She was the third member of this wonderful experience, but um, even if she's not, uh, she, uh, her, um, her strength and her uh, in, in translation and her- I am um, here. You are here. Thank you, Tahira. Um, so the three of us, uh, Tahira is uh, the most recognized uh, South Asian uh, translator of Urdu literature um, and, uh, and not only South Asian translator, but world translator of Urdu literature. So I'm happy that the three of us were a part of uh, a very special experience um, that uh, actually Susham anchored in terms of uh, uh, literature. So um, I'm going to start um, the, the sort of the, the meatier uh, con content about Sushamji by saying that Sushum embodies several very rich concepts, even theories. And number one is the acculturation theory. Sushum in uh, uh, in uh, 1989 um, wrote. Havan, and recently only in social sciences, um, there has been this uh, breakdown of what the experience of the immigrant community is. And they have, they have tried to uh, figure out a way to sort of organize it in um, different models that they uh, call um, acculturation strategies or acculturation models. And my point with uh, Sushan's literature is that before this theory, uh, she already embedded it in her 
um, stories and in her short stories and in her novels. Um, so the way acculturation strategies nowadays are divided uh, in four main categories, they are uh, defined by two main questions. One is, is the Deshi heritage or is the immigrant's home heritage uh, preserved? Or, and is it uh, rejected? And is the whole society uh, becoming the, the home for the immigrant? So this preservation of the old or embracing of the host uh, or new is the, the sort of the defining, um, the, the, the defining sort of axis of uh, uh, categorization. So there is integration, assimilation, separation, and marginalization. All these four categories, she has them in her stories. Let me... Um, just show you something that I uh, made in order to be a little bit more uh, clear. So you can see with integration, um, there is the host and then there is the home. And we're gonna talk about what is home and what is host later uh, in her literature. But you see there is something in the middle where there is integration, uh, where there is a definition of self that combines from both areas. Uh, you have the separation where there's absolutely no integration. And uh, these are um, sort of as, as much as possible separated areas and domains in which a, an individual acts and they are quite uh, uh, different. Then there is marginalization in the case of uh, um, the, the home culture overtaking completely the, the individual's um, identity. And because of it not being a part of the mainstream uh, of the host culture, then um, that individual feels and is or is uh, marginalized. And then there is the assimilation. It's the other way around where the host, um, the host values and uh, environment, they take over in, in terms of the references and anchors for the individual's identity. And then, in that case, um, we, we're talking about full assimilation. We, when we think of, of Sushum's stories, when we think of her uh, novels, she has representation of all these. And we know that her characters in the vast majority are women. So she's a writer that writes about women. Uh, so she has. Um, an authentic voice while writing about women, which is an extremely important point uh, in, in, even in comparative literature. Uh, and uh, we will, um, when I, so we are, um, as, as, uh, as, as we're thinking about, about her and the variety of characters and the variety of themes, in, in a conversation with, uh, actually with uh, uh, Professor Sh uh, Jishnu Shankar, um, I'm, I'm afraid of playing the video. I don't think you heard her, uh, so I'm not gonna play it. Maybe at the end, I will try to play. But she's, she's talking about Tilila um, Takana. Uh, and actually what she says is that she looks at life. She looks at a lot of uh, things that happen around her. She um, listens a lot, but then everything is bikrahua. Everything is spread around. Everything is um, in no order. It's not linear. But then she would look for one thing, and very often it's a trope. And that trope defines the space, the character, the timeline, the, the, the theme. And when, when I'm, when with my students um, and, 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 and herself, when we are thinking about her tropes, this is what we come up with. Uh, the rituals or those elements that seem to be traditional even at home or outside, uh, like the music party where there is singing of, uh, or, or, um, or there is instrumental performance or dance performance where the arts are, 
uh, that's 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 the symbol of the heritage, the community, the home, the belonging, the bonding. That's where people come in to share the space, um, but also share their values, share their beliefs, share their even mannerisms uh, that come from the home. And then there are these other sets of tropes like the wings, the birds, the wind, the sky, uh, the windows. Uh, and, and it seems that they, they, they represent this free will and the dreams. And they're not only of young people, although the majority of her characters that are related to these uh, tropes uh, are uh, young females, but she has several um, um, other characters like widows or, um, or people in their um, uh, later advanced age uh, that dream about um, some kind of uh, uh, some kind of freedom from something that has been um, working as uh, a limitation to uh, their own um, expression and their own uh, life. Then there are the, the tropes of the walls, the doors, the snakes, the breathing um, that symbolize the restrictions, the expectations, the pressure themselves. And then there is the streets. Uh, she has uh, a story Broadway. She has uh, also a story Sarah Kilai. She, she herself in an interview, and I have it there. Um, again, I'm not going to play it. Um, she, she says uh, um, when, when the uh, Pravasi um, come, uh, to the states, uh, there is a kind of lie that they need to establish. Uh, it can be too fast or it could be too slow, and they need to uh, make sure that they adjust to what is here and what is in, in what is outside and what is inside. And 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 the street, it seems uh, in her in her um, sort of vocabulary, artistic vocabulary, is the rich tapestry of life that goes even beyond. Um, the host or the home environment, the immigrant or the non-immigrant experience. Uh, so um, I'm going to give you here a, a, a small um, example of the way uh, she uh, artistically um, and uh, masterfully describes um, a woman's um, self-definition. Arti felt that her independence had become anathema to all men. And now among them, including leading the charge against her was her own son. He had demands on her as a mother, but she felt that he could not hear the demands of the woman who was buried inside his mother. The child's birth had defined her status as a wife and a mother, a status that had placed an enclosing wall around the possibilities in her life. As her friends streamed out, they congratulated her again on the wedding of her son and Arti felt like a tree standing high on the bank of a swift river. No matter how much water flowed past, none of it would ever touch her. Now, here in, in this, in this uh, uh, quote, you see um, the, the, the self-definition that um, the, the, the self-identity that, that has a procedural sort of uh, timeline with Arti in the music party. And that is so strong and so powerful that uh, Sushan decides to end with it. But it is about a dialogue between cultures. It is a dialogue between um, pasts, uh, between past and present, between experiences. It is a dialogue between uh, different realities and different traditions. Um, and isn't this what the definition of comparative literature is? It is. So in, in a way, I want to say that she embodies the main principles of uh, um, comparative literature. Um, uh, yesterday, I was at a very interesting exhibition, um, which was um, the creating a space for a dialogue between artists and scientists. 
and it was about what can what cannot be visually represented was visually represented there what cannot be sensory represented was represented there and and then there was this um intersection of unexpected dimensions of light and i was thinking isn't that what actually sushum's work is um, it creates a space where a deeper connection between the mundane outer world bound by social norms and spiritual or cultural perceptives, um, inner world of emotions, intuitions, loyalties, beliefs can meet. So it's like there is the outer world bound by, so by social norms, and then the uh, inner world where things are mostly spiritual and culturally defined. Uh, this is a space between the perceived host environment and home cultures, but it's even more than that. Her diaspora defined experiences and reflections are a dialogue between complex social, cultural, and psychological paradigms. And it is a dialogue between languages, the female, the male, the gender, gendered language uh, present in her writing, ideologies, um, uh, religions, cultures, and so forth. Um, isn't that what actually comparative literature is all about? And in comparative literature, not only, but also in uh, other contexts, we, um, we talk about um, the, 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 the possible um, way and the possible uh, principles, methods of uh, study. Um, she found her own um, approach to the study of the human mind uh, in the context of the Deshi diaspora, uh, not only in the States, also in Europe, as she had that experience, we all know. Um, and uh, so, she, so she travels in, in the mind uh, and her, her voice of a narrator uh, and uh, the voices of the characters very often blend in a way that we're not sure uh, who's, who's speaking at, at this point. Um, so identity, relationships, memories, mental dynamics, uh, dreams, and so forth, mostly expressed and uh, articulated through a female perspective is the way she was able to travel. Um, now, in, at NYU and in many academic institutions nowadays, we're talking about decolonizing our teaching, decolonizing our text, decolonizing our study. She, she did it. This is based on what decolonizing means and look at what she did. She amplified and brought in the lived experiences. She challenged cultural definitions and stereotypes. She re-examined mental models and hierarchical worldviews. She accepted that we don't have all the answers. She articulated experiences in a more inclusive way. She created spaces for silenced voices. She embraced plurality of experiences and truths. She de-romanticized the home or the past or even the women. Uh, and she acknowledged that the roles we play in, uh, um, and the privilege we bring when we interpret the text or when we choose the text or when we give opinions about the text. Um, I know that the, that the de-romanticizing of women is what she uh, really enjoyed. And I know that uh, Tahira Nakhi, uh, my colleague, also enjoyed when she does uh, Ismat. And we often talked about how women being critical about women might be the most difficult um, task to accomplish, but to accomplish it in a way with respect and with love and with understanding and with depth and with complexity. And she does it in Ishtihar in a way and in uh, Amar Bel, uh, 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 Amar Bel Gatha. So uh, Gatha Amar Belki uh, in her novel. Uh, so in, in both the Ishtihar and Amar Bel, the, the uh, characters, uh, the female characters are widows and uh, their mothers-in-law and uh, they're struggling um, identifying themselves in any other way um, beyond the family. So the, the, the fact that they're a mother, a wife or a widow, a sister, 
someone's uh, um, someone's uh, 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 let's say uh, sister-in-law. Uh, all these kinship terms are the only ones used in order for um, the character to uh, identify as a living being. And here the question is always, and what is a non-mother? What is a non-wife? Does, does she exist? Can she exist? What is a, a non-sister? Um, what, is, what is a woman? What is, what is a female um, human? What is it? Uh, is it only family uh, identified? And uh, she, she does this um, criticism um, that um, uh, in a way furthers the idea of uh, um, the, uh, let's get out of the domain of domesticity, out of the domain of familial relations uh, when we think about women and when they think about themselves. Um, so so as, as, as I presented to you the four uh, strategies or the four models of acculturation, <laughs> I thought, well, Sushant has her own. And uh, um, uh, I think it was Arti, um, the main character in uh, the music party. Uh, she has this inner monologue going on throughout the story. And she, she remembers how her relatives in India started um, blaming her for having changed in a way that they don't like and that it's not good for the family. Uh, and, and, and she said, um, what do you mean? I have not changed. In fact, you are the ones who are trying to change me. So um, isn't, isn't there another model that she's adding um, of because there is an additional layer that the female perspective um, adds to the uh, Pravasi experience, um, doesn't she actually uh, develop another model in, in, in her stories um, where um, it is completely self-defined? Because every woman has um, uh, all her characters, we see um, that they have um, these looks these flexible hierarchies. At any point of time, they are entering a particular level of the hierarchy, whether the husband is in the house, whether the son is in the house, whether the uh, father-in-law is in the house, or whether the bahu is in the house. So, so it's like for, they're floating, they're, they're flexible, they're moving, they're dynamic, these hierarchies. How does then uh, an identity form um, of course, it's a dynamic process, but yet, how do these hierarchies affect, uh, what kind of effect do they have on the female identity? And this is what Susham seems to be um, very interested in, to say, why should that be the case? Can we, can we work outside of these frameworks? And some of her characters do. Um, I want to um, share with you a particular um, poem that uh, Susham um, has in, um, in her Shabdon ki Kirkia. And uh, the, the translation is uh, uh, done by Soma Vyas with uh, some uh, uh, edits from me. So um, I would like us to think about that maybe dream where she she wants to um, she wants to accomplish this dream task of self identification um, in uh, connection or not in connection with someone else in the family. So she says, "You talked about flying together. I asked, where are the wings? You said, "I will give you wings," and I started flying. Uh, I asked again, where are the wings? You said, see, I have attached them. I started flying again. Suddenly the stormy wind came blowing. I was scared. I asked again, where are the wings? You comforted me. They're right there, keep flying. I started looking here and there for the wings. I felt tossed around by the wind on the rocky ground in the thorny bushes. You said you didn't have wings, but you used to think that wings would grow once you started flying. Then I saw 
You were flying too without wings. You ruled over the wind. You were hugging the sky. I didn't want to wait for you to fall while lying on the floor. Neither did I want to see you tossed around and tumbling down. I was afraid that like me, you too might fall down in agonizing pain on this burning earth, or that you might believe me and forget your strength and desire to fly. Or who knows, your unflinching trust may actually help you grow wings and keep you flying. So is there any chance of me growing wings? You see, the reason why I love this poem is because the, the voice becomes unclear whose is it midway. Uh, it, is, it is clearly a kind of dialogue. Who is she in a dialogue with? Uh, that is the part. And who's, who's, so is there any chance of me growing wings? Is it her voice? Is it her inner voice? Is it someone else's voice? This is why I, um, I, I love this poem because it's so representative of the kind of openness and the kind of, um, the kind of um, um, unconventional way that she was thinking about the world. Um, so when, when we think about her main concern about uh, female uh, experience not being a part of, uh, as Purva said that in the beginning, not being a part necessarily of, uh, of the main scope of research and of writing, um, she said that in, uh, in an article she published. When it comes to girls, and, and, and the article is about um, the immigrant uh, uh, experience. When it comes to girls, the problem gets immensely more complicated. American and Indian values are completely at odds. According to Indian values, no matter how modern or fashionable a girl, she's considered good only if she's traditional. In India, even though girls are becoming more educated and successful, when it comes to marriage, they are still measured on the traditional scale. Even in today's world, girls represent the owner of the family. They are never given the same freedom as their brothers and parents who do give them the freedom are often doubtful of their choice. How should our young reconcile these two fundamentally different philosophies? Whether we agree 100% or not with this statement, it is bold, it is courageous, and it, it, it sort of gives us the, um, uh, the undercurrent of the way she thinks about this process of uh, identity creation. In Rupture, um, she says, how many forms can an individual take? How many meanings is he weighted with and tied to, imprisoned with, within so many voices? Is it some deficit in my own comprehension or a failure in the voices themselves which surround me? The fragments of these voices are like flakes of snow that melt and are destroyed before they can solidify. And all I hear is the sound of breakage, the sound of the shattering of this being who is trying to weave her own voice. I'm just afraid that the voice might snap and be scattered even before it is woven. And this is one of the uh, greatest uh, short stories that she's written. And of course, one of the best translations by, uh, by my colleague, uh, Tahira Nakvi. But uh, how, how complex um, and how deep is she uh, in, in ending the story where we know that um, th there might be an end that uh, will be devastating, uh, but there might not be. Uh, and she herself um, stopped there, although she would share with the students that um, uh, it's based on a real story. Uh, but she didn't want to tell them what the real end uh, in, in real life was of that story. When, when we um, think about uh, her, uh, Purva also mentioned that, um, we think of her as a positive feminist, as a feminist, as a feminist who, um, does not bring um, 
the the negativity surrounding the struggles but she brings the constructive the cons the, the constructive and the positive and the resourceful uh setting that women um create for themselves or uh, modify for themselves and these are the questions that she always wanted the students to think about who is the heroine is she a wife a mother a mother-in-law a widow daughter sister lover professional individual uh, and then often she will say, do you follow the narrator? Who is, who is the narrator? Is it me or is it them? And then her voice will, will, would move from uh, one point to another. And students would say, is that stream of consciousness that you're doing with the main characters? And she would say, I don't know, maybe, but it's also my stream, con my, my, my stream of consciousness. And then how is she created, the main character? How is she created? Uh, is she the main one or just a supporting one? Why do you think? What is the symbolism? What, what is she telling you? And then what, what would her life have been in India? She, she would ask that question, especially in the context of the widow characters, um, because of the uh, specific uh, sort of um, position they are put in. Uh, and uh, in a dialogue with uh, Jishnu Shankar for the uh, UT Austin flagship, she said, um, when we think traditionally about widows in India, we think of them as kamzor. But what I see of them being able to do in a foreign land, they're brave and they're, and they're unbelievably committed to uh, growing as as, 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 as individuals. So they're, they're courageous and they're strong. So we see the strength when it's not expected um, in, 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 in a different context. Why does it have to be the case? She would ask the students. Um, and uh, students would often ask uh, why, why she um, holds certain, wh why she has some certain characters to go to an extreme. Uh, and she said, well, um, I, that's, that's how I, I, I see things. Uh, I see them as extremes and us moving in the middle between these extremes and uh, negotiating them. Um, and then her further questions about her female characters, who is in her network or support and why? Does she need one? Uh, what is the interaction with the host culture in the case of parents and children? And what is the impact of the home culture on the process of identity development? What are the ways by which families pass on home cultural knowledge, values, beliefs, and practices to the next generation? And here she would have very passionate and very emotional responses from the students who actually relate to her, to her writing. Uh, here is something that I remember. Um, a student reading um, and uh, um, being very um, critical about it. Uh, it's the beginning of the story. Uh, yes, Perry, a woman, uh, Perry was a woman as beautiful as a fairy. He used to live in there too. Her skin would shine bright and flawless like polished silver. Like a tantalizing full moon, she glistened. Her slender and fair body was so delicately crafted that it seemed like the master work of the, fine, of the finest artist. He had been totally enchanted by her. He was spellbound to the point of losing sight of everything else. He wanted to possess her and could not imagine living without her. She had to be his and his alone. Perry was quite simple and innocent. She knew little of worldly affairs. She was in her 20th year and had just finished college. She was considering going back to school to become a teacher. He gathered, he gathered all his money together into a bundle and presented himself at the doorstep of her parents. He returned home with her as his wife. The students really struggle mentally with this story. The fact that there is a foreshadowing of the end bothers them because they themselves would say we hope for a good ending although she's um, locked in a particular world 
why doesn't she break away from it? And Sushum, Sushum would say, well, I'm being realistic. Not everyone can. Um, she would add the immigrant experience and, uh, and then um, she would also uh, have some <laughs> questions about sexuality and women. Um, her character, Guddo, has a lover. Um, another character uh, is looking for a husband at 70 in, uh, in Ishtihar. Um, students are, is that typical of uh, the Indian community? Um, and she would say there is nothing typical or atypical. They are people and they feel different ways. And it's a diversity of experiences that I'm uh, also uh, um, sort of re uh, constructing in my in my works. Um, this is this is a particular reaction uh, of a student of mine who chose to write her final paper on Sushum, and this is 2022. The reason why I'm, I have a lot of reactions from many years ago, but I, I wanted to show you that even in 2022, it's almost half a decade after Budo, uh, when she read it, she could relate to it. So uh, recently in an essay class, I was exploring the entrenchment of loneliness in the West and personally reflecting on how it has permeated my own personality, having recently moved to New York from India myself. So it's from another class. To say Sushan Bedi's Havan resonated with me would be insulting. I felt as though she was narrating chapters from a lived experience I didn't have the time to reflect on. Suddenly, all these feelings I had about moving and starting life all over again found words, and suddenly I felt less alone. There is something so intimate about the relationship between reader and writer. Her work took a new meaning in my personal context, and I wonder how much meaning exists in the non-book, as does in the book. But I digress, coming back to loneliness. Firstly, Goudot's experience is so vast and nuanced, yet universal. That's such a challenging line to thread. Goudot both represents the experiences of several South Asian women in diaspora, but remains individual. Betty embeds the inner turmoil of not belonging to either continent within even the structure of the story. It permeates every aspect. The internal conflict lends itself to a hybrid kind of loneliness one that isn't quite as lonely, but is lonely nonetheless. The familial ties remain while one has the opportunity to live, work, and make a life alone. The story explores with those dualistic exploration of loneliness, the fleeting freedom from a South Asian woman with children and the immense burden of responsibility. The humanity that oozes from the pores of this story is unmissable. So um, my, my, this was, this was uh, something that um, just uh, shook me. And uh, of course, uh, that student came to my office and, and we talked at length about uh, Sushum and she read all the rest of the stories that are uploaded, not all of them, but uh, the ones that are uploaded on our LMS. But the point is that um, she was able to connect um, to uh, the younger uh, generation, uh, to the second generation and the third generation that are creating their own narratives and are creating their, their own models um, of uh, identity creation. But um, she spoke, she was able to speak um, above generations, above um, specific issues. And she was able to relate uh, at all levels with, uh, uh, with, with her readers, uh, which is um, an unbelievable um, achievement. And uh, in this way, she is alive and she still uh, churns our, um, our um, minds and our emotions uh, in a deep way. Um, this is something that, um, you know, Sushan was always very um, interested in um, uh, writing in Hindi. Purva also mentioned that. Um, and she said how 
was very opinionated about writing in Hindi, but was not opinionated about her work being translated. She appreciated efforts to translate her, but she really thought that her work is self-sufficient, uh, existing in language. And when she would be asked, do you think that there is um, a chance to change? Um, and, and, and here I'm including the so-called domestic, domestication point. Uh, uh, according to Venuti, uh, translators, while using language and concepts the readers are familiar with, actually decontextualize and inadvertently rewrite uh, the, tra the translated texts to uh, confirm uh, to conform to domestic ideology that matches the demands of the uh, dominant society. Um, somehow, um, translation, she wasn't concerned about that. Uh, and that was very um, uh, sort of, um, I, I, I never could understand why. Um, but I, I think that because she wanted, because she felt that um, every character of hers, as every individual in the real world has their own unique paths. That's how her works will have their own unique path and it is not going to be in her hands. Um, so uh, she was successful um, by not gaining immediate publicity, um, which is even a bigger accomplishment. Uh, because she was writing in Hindi and because of um, all her texts coming in translation much later. But in my mind, um, she embodies the principles of comparative literature. She embodies the principles of uh, the uh, Pravas experience. She embodies um, all those things that make the world that um, she lived in um, accessible to us. And the only thing we can say is uh, uh, thank you. And the only thing we can do is to continue studying her uh, and, and continue to um, unpack uh, her um, complex ideas and artistic uh, sort of way of uh, uh, approaching the world. Um, I'm going to stop at this point so that we can have uh, um, a, a, an open conversation. Uh, I hope um, this was something that um, you um, are uh, going to agree with the things that I said, but even if you disagree, let's talk about that. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Professor Elieva, for that insightful presentation um, and for taking us through texts and translations of uh, Shushamji's work. Um, to, to thank you for the memorial lecture as well as to respond to the lecture, I would now like to invite first uh, Professor Rita Kothari, the co-director of the Ashoka Center for Translation. Professor Kothari. That was a very uh, compelling talk, uh, Professor Eleva, and I'm very, very thankful to you. Uh, I want to kind of begin, actually, there's, there's so much here that from the time that actually Sanchit began to introduce Sushim to us, uh, to the way you managed to sort of evoke an entire universe and its people, a universe that is occupied and uh, inhabited by a gamut of interesting men and women, and especially women, that there is a lot here to say and a lot here to think about. And I think I'll simply go over some of the things that struck me very deeply while I was listening to you. Uh, I want to go back to that quote, which Sanchit said something about, uh, in, in Sushamji's own words, ki bhasha apni, apna ya begana mehsus karane mein bhasha ki badi bhumi ka hoti hai. And I feel that your lecture managed to actually show us not only uh, a preoccupation with uh, how are these home cultures to be nurtured or to be preserved or to be interrupted and intervened in, but what is it to forge a vocabulary and forge a language in another culture? 
And in some sense, I think it sort of goes back, therefore, to this question, ki bhasha ke saath hi apna ya begana mehsoos hota hai. To apna kya hai aur begana kya hai. I think your talk actually made a very compelling case of the many situations in uh, the vast sort of corpus of Sushamji's work that you have touched upon. Uh, you kind of begin by uh, situating Sushamji within the concerns of Pravasi Sahitya. Uh, and I found it quite interesting that these different multiple locations that Sushamji occupies, which sort of came over so well in your talk of sometimes being a woman, sometimes being a Pravasi, and meditating upon the many questions which are not separate in some sense from the homes we come from and from the cultures that we are encountering. I found the meditation upon death in the story of San and the uh, excerpt that you quoted from the Gita, uh, very, very interesting. But my particularly my, the point at which I was very arrested is to actually think about Sadak Ki Lai. And I think that was a very lovely example of how the streets, the sounds, the smells, or wo lay tibra lakti hai, ya wo lay vilambit hai, usi mein kai bar zindagi nikal jati hai, ye sochte huye, ki sahi lay kaun si honi chahiye. Or zindagi ki bhi wahi lay hoti hai. So I found that very interesting. Uh, even in Gatha Amar Bel ki and so on, the idea of grief, vishad ka jo dard hai, ya vishad ki jo baat usme se jo nikal aati hai, uh, ya vibakt ka jo I found these, all these observations actually tell us that there is, here is a writer whose universe is quite huge, but there is a sentience with which she seems to be approaching both very metaphysical issues and also very everyday issues of immigrant Indians uh, and also as a woman. I, I'm kind of, I also think what this lecture has done for us and what today's event managed to do is to actually expand for us the meanings of Sushyam Bedi's work. I mean, there can be many ways of remembering somebody. There can be many ways of enshrining the memory of somebody. But I think in some sense to actually intimately engage with a writer's words is perhaps the most meaningful uh, enshrining and it is the most meaningful tribute that can ever be paid. So I'm, it's, I'm sort of uh, affirmed in some sense uh, in the belief that this is exactly the kind of tribute that writers need. And uh, what you have managed to do today is so kind of appropriate and so finely tuned in giving us the corpus of Sushyam Bedi's work but also showing us the intensities of the various preoccupations that she has had. Uh, I've already taken up a lot of time. I'm sure there are people in the audience who want to say something to you, uh, Gabriela, if I may. And uh, maybe we can take two to three responses. Is that okay, Sanjit? Uh, yeah, if you can take a couple of responses from the audience and then we move over to Nita and bring a closure. But thank you for giving me this opportunity. I really, really uh, enjoyed myself. Um, thank you, Professor Kothari, uh, for echoing what uh, Shushanji herself had said, that writers are indeed remembered by the things that they wrote. Uh, following your uh, uh, invite, I invite uh, you all or anyone from you uh, to uh, yes, uh, Professor Nakvi, uh, please. Um, Professor, could you unmute yourself? Um, okay. Yes. Uh, thank you, Gabriella, for an ex for an absolutely wonderful, amazing analysis. We've talked about these things so often together with Sushum. And now we talk about these in her absence. One of the things that I really want to emphasize here, especially as a translator, is that there are two things that happen. One is that you know the writer is known in 
his own world of language. In other words, she is a Hindi writer first and foremost. However, we all of us are here in the diaspora, I think almost all of us. And we have young students who are anxious or who we are actually anxious to bring Susham to. And how do we do that? It's, it will only happen through translation. And uh, she must be translated. And one of the things that happen, has happened is that there were so many diasporic writers, uh, Bharati Mukherjee, Chitra Devakaruni, Anita Desai, they became very well known. They became very famous primarily uh, because they were writing in English and we cannot discredit the importance of that. However, Sushum's work, if you look at the entire uh, body of her work, has approached the idea of um, immigration, immig the, the immigrant experience in a much more uh, interesting, dynamic, expansive, uh, detailed, richly uh, detailed, observant way. Yet, she's not on that list. And I would want her to be there because she, for me, she is. And uh, that the only way that will happen is if her work is well translated and it's brought out there. That is what happened with Isma Chuktai. Nobody knew anything about Isma. Now she is the most uh, read um, feminist, Indian feminist in, uh, in the West. And Sushum is right up there. So we need to do that. That's really important. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Nakwi, for emphasizing the worlds that can be found in and through translation. Um, I invite uh, more responses, more tributes. Um, um, yes, Rahul ji, please. Hi, uh, uh, thank you, Sanjay. So I just want to share a sh um, short, short narration of incident. Because when Susham's uh, first novel, Havan, was translated into English and published in, in England, so I think within a few months, Susham got an invitation at a panel session, which was uh, which had William Starin and Salman Rushdie on it, and Susham was the third panelist on that. But interesting thing was that it was only because the novel had been translated into English that Susham got invited, invited to a panel with Salman Rushdie and William Starin. And Susham was very excited about it. So, but Susham and I always we had this conversation because I always said to her, we, we, you should get translated because your audience will, you know. But somehow Susham was, you know, as Gabriela mentioned in her lecture, Susham was not all that pushy on the translation part. Or she was not. She said, no, no, I'm Khushum. But um, I'm very happy that now finally, because I definitely believe and agree that her, like Tahira mentioned, Gabriela, that translating her work will definitely expand the audience and her message will go to them. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Rahul Ji. We are certainly honored to not only be translating Shusham Ji's own work, but also. Uh, through the fund, uh, the memorial fund set up by you and your family to be able to translate uh, the work of so many uh, other uh, women authors. Uh, I think I'll take uh, uh, one last response uh, from Ahana and then I'll invite my colleague Nita. Yes, Ahana, please. Hello. Um, thank you so much for today's lecture. I really enjoyed um, listening to it. So here we are having a lot of discussion surrounding the importance of translation. And I understand how important it is. But there was also a slide that mentioned the urge to decolonize ourselves from, um, you know, the mainstream. And what I don't understand is then how do we approach this dilemma of um translating into dominant languages, translating works into dominating uh, into dominant um, global languages, but then at the same time, urging ourselves to decolonize um, our culture. So that's something that still um, perplexes me. Thank you. May I briefly respond to Ahana and then maybe we can uh, 
Uh, so Anna, there is a English and Hindi very often also function as uh, these link languages. So the idea is not to begin and end with English. The idea is to create vehicular languages so that Sushan Bedi's work can also go to other Indian languages, right? So, I mean, we completely see your point. And I think a lot of us now, not only Ashoka Center for Translation, but a lot of publishers, I mean, Urvashi was here in the audience, Zuban is also doing it, which is that now a lot of translations are also going into Indian languages. What used to happen historically, traditionally, in an uninstitutionalized manner, now actually needs a, a more fuel to do that. But that is also very much part of the plan. So this is only a beginning. But thanks for raising that very important question. I think we can now turn to Nita and- uh, can, I, can I say a quick thing? Yeah, yes, please, please, Varun, you're most welcome. Yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone who uh, came to this. I wanted to uh, thank Professor Ilieva most importantly for putting that. I didn't know all this stuff about my mother, so it was wonderful <laughs> uh, to hear it, uh, you know, kind of analyzed. And, uh, and so I, I think it's wonderful uh, that the program you have put together and uh, I appreciate uh, Professor Nakhvi's view as well. Thank you, Dara uh, for putting those words together. And it means a lot to us, but it's also the mission you have put together at the Ashoka Center for Translation, which is really quite inspiring because we, we have done some progress with, with just here today, instructing so many people on, on, on the import of, uh, you know, Sushum Bedi's work, but the other three, four, hopefully 10 writers uh, we take from other Hindi lang uh, other Indian languages and translate them, as you said, uh, to uh, both Hindi to English um, to propose to uh, introduce them to a much broader audience. There's so much talent that is isolated uh, that can be brought to the fore uh, using uh, language as a, as you said a vehicle. So I just wanted to thank you all. It's a wonderfully uh, inspiring mission, and uh, you know happy to be part of it. Yeah. Thank you, Varun. I mean, you put, you repost faith in us when we had just barely begun. We were a month old. So I thank you so much. Yeah, Nita, over to you. Purva, you've raised an important question. Can we just be in touch with you over email about this? Yeah, of course. I, I think it's just, I hear people who want to contribute. So I'm like, I don't know the answer. So I think yeah, yeah. we should definitely talk Let's, over email yeah, about it. Yeah. I'll send you an email on this and then we can see what to do. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, thank you, Professor. And thank you, Varunji. And as I uh, put in the chat regarding your questions, as well as um, any other requests you may have, particularly regarding recordings, uh, you may get in touch with us uh, via email. Uh, now, uh, thanking you all for being here today once again, I would like to invite my colleague Nita Gupta, who's also sort of the mastermind, if I were to call her that, behind this project, who's been actively uh, coordinating uh, uh, and making this project a success. Uh, Nita, uh, over to you uh, for the final vote of thanks. Nita, unmute yourself, sweetie. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I just want to take a quick minute to thank everyone here before we close. So Professor Ileva, thank you so much for bringing Sushum's work alive. You know, each character, and there, there were so many stories that, you know, which I had read, and you just brought each little, little nuance uh, it was beautiful. And as one of the, you know, somebody just mentioned Maya Chadda, I think has written in the ch chat window that you brought both personal and scholarly focus on Sushum's work. So thank you for doing that for us today and for bringing, you know, it's really you're bringing everything alive uh, through this lecture. And I'd also like to thank uh, Rahul Bediji and the Bedi family, Varun Purva, for believing in the importance. And as Purva underlined, it was one of Sushum's uh, you know, that she herself believed that translation would really change the way people looked at South Asian literature. So thank you so much for, uh, you know, supporting this project and for being there. You know, we reach out to you and I, I know whether, you know, at any time the family has been completely involved and so, uh, you know, so much a part of growing this project. So thank you very much for this, uh, you know, opportunity to work with you. and. Um, 
I'd also like to thank Sushum's colleagues and friends. Professor Francis Pritchett was here with us through the lecture. Thank you for spending this morning with us. Uh, Tahira ji, thank you for, you know, not just being there, but also, uh, you know, sharing uh, such important uh, thoughts on translation again. Uh, it's It's been wonderful and we should all stay in touch and, you know, remain connected through email as well. Uh, I'd also like to take a minute to thank and acknowledge our publishing partner, Urvashi Botalia from Zoban Books, who's here. Zoban Books is an iconic women's imprint, and I think it's really the perfect home for the books that we want to bring to you through this uh, Women Translating Women project. So thank you, Zoban, for coming on board, and thank you, Urvashi, for being who you are. And you know the next names. These are the translators. Without whom these books, you know, there's no, you know, they are the ones who will be bringing these books alive to you, to the readers. So thank you, Astri, Kripa, Ipsha, Saba, Gogu, and others who I might have missed. Thank you for being with us this evening. It's wonderful to have you here. Ipsha, there's, I think, there's a, there's quite a few other translators as well who are not working on uh, this project, but who've been sort of committed to this. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the essence of this whole, uh, uh, you know, the idea of women's writing being translated by women translators. So thank you for your, you know, for your support and for, uh, for being here with us, you know, because an evening like this, uh, you know, to things are pulling you in so many directions, but the fact that you chose to spend this evening with us means a lot, means everything to us. And a huge round of applause to our team, to Sanchit for holding it all together so beautifully this evening. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Arnav, Sanchit, Aditya, Dia, for everybody at the uh, Ashoka University Center for Translation. Thank you so much. And looking forward to, uh, you know, hosting other sessions and hosting other dialogues around the subject, around Sushamji's work, around translating women. Uh, and I'm sure many opportunities and workshops are planned and coming up, which we'll keep you informed about. So thank you so much and a very, very good night from us here in Delhi. Thank you so much, Neeta. And thank you so much, everyone, once again. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Elieva, uh, once again, for, for allowing us the opportunity to pay the rightful tribute to Shushanji on her third death anniversary today. Um, have a good evening, everyone in India, and those of you in New York, have a great day ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.